Let me call to order the Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency meeting for um, today, September 24th. If you please rise. Charlotte, if you'll lead us, please. Certainly. Please rise, place your hand over your heart, and follow me in the Pledge to the Flag. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. When you're dealing with farmers, you dress like one. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I tried to hold the meeting. Except for the council. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, roll call, please. Chair Malkin. Here. Director Clayton. Here. Here. Director Clayton. Here. Director Kelly. Here. Director Torture. Here. Okay, let's see. I'm looking. Um, Sam is here. And I don't see any other alternates. Okay. Um... Any changes to the agenda? I would uh, recommend one chair, Mark. Um, that you switch the order of items seven and eight to eight ahead of seven. Okay. Any um, item seven and eight? Those are informational items anyway, right? Right. It's just that it, it will flow better with the budget first. Okay. All right. Anybody opposed to doing that? All right, so ordered. Uh, let's uh, deal with um, <clears throat> public comments. Uh, anybody have anything for the GMA that's not on the Yes, sir. If you do, come on up. Steve, we'll let Dr. Bach. You can come on up. <laughs> Dr. B. Um, <clears throat> at the last technical advisory group meeting, um, one of the recommendations that we had was that we think that there should be a board workshop or study session or whatever you call it on the issue of... Um, what we're going to, whether or not we should be changing any kind of GMA policies on the issue of um, areas where we have higher groundwater levels, but the water quality is deteriorating, i.e. South Las Postas Basin, north part of Camarillo, those areas, because it's clear that fitting these, it's kind of like putting a square peg in a round hole right now, and, and this is a little different approach than that's being recommended um, by various parties than what the GMA has done before. So we thought that it would be good to kind of lay out the whole framework of what what are the problems and what are some of the, the options, and they are different. This is coming out of the SAG group? Out of the technical group. The technical group. Um, and staff do you, do, you, uh, do you need this uh, workshop? before you proceed with the next TAG um, group meeting? Or is it incidental to it? Probably not. The only okay. thing is okay. that it's probably better to have it sooner rather than later because there are some projects that are okay. coming um, along where that would have then, to be dealt with. Then I would suggest, um, and you're in agreement with that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. October, then, the October meeting would be a good time. Okay. You set, up, set up what you need. And then notif uh, notice it like we've done in the past for other workshops. Make sure you have a good agenda and set a date and do whatever you have to do to get your get the information out there. Okay. Okay. Everybody okay with that? Okay. This is a board workshop. Uh, it's a workshop that the board can attend because it'll be agenda agendized. But it's a workshop really run by Steve and staff, I assume, right? But it's for the board, right? But it's it's meant for the board. Yeah. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Oh, I apologize. Okay. So really, what you want is an agenda item on next month's meeting dealing with this issue. Yes. That is that the approach you? Yes. Because we were at the at the group meeting, we were afraid that you know it's going to be relatively time consuming and whether, whether we haven't should be set. we haven't used board meetings for workshops. We've used board meetings for informational issues after a workshop has kind of synthesized it down. So you decide what you want with Steve. If you want to give us an overview of the problem at the next board meeting, I'm okay with that. If you believe there ought to be a workshop to get more input, then roll it to the next meeting. Um, but don't bring it to, don't, I, I don't want to do a two hour workshop in the middle of a board meeting. We haven't done that in the past and I don't want to do that now. Okay? All right, let's do that. Uh, yes, sir. Good afternoon. 
Um, my name is David Norton. Um, I was concerned when a farmer at the July meeting said he lost the use of 40 trees because of lack of water. Um, if you multiply this by other farmers in the state, you have less food, higher prices, and throw in the population explosion. It's a bad combination. Um, the farmers and ranchers are the backbone of this country. Um, the water banking and agriculture should be the first priority. It's tough being a farmer having to deal with environmental issues also. There is technology though, such as variable rate irrigation and surface drip irrigation. Um, maybe these soil moisture monitors um, can help them. I also appreciate the complicated task the FCGMA has in figuring out how to allocate less water to more people. And thank you very much for your um, town hall style of meetings. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anybody else have any um, items for the board that are not on the agenda? Okay. Uh, let's see. Board member comments. Anybody have anything? It didn't rain since our dark August meeting. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> Hopefully we'll get some rain. No, no, we'll, we'll just we'll just ask Steve to give us the absolute date, and he's working on it. I wasn't told. Has it been uh, our history to have him do a rain dance? Uh, they take a uh, they take a um, office poll at United on how much rain, and Steve, I don't think, is authorized to bet because he has the answer. Right? <laughs> uh, we have a consent agenda. Uh, I need a motion to approve. Move to consent. Second. Okay. Motion a second. Any discussion on any of the consent items? You guys? Okay. Sure. I think I'd like to discuss this uh, MOU. There's a couple things I think need to have a little bit okay. of attention. Okay. Let's do this. Um, if you'll withdraw your motion, let me just. The motion. All right. We'll just go through this. Uh, a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion on that? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Opposed? Turning on. All right. Item number two. Dave. On this uh, MOU, the actual document itself, I noticed on page 4 of 7, section 4, where it says invoices, I don't think that wording is accurate. It says that, um, in essence, it ought to be that uh, the total funding equals GMA's annual funding times 2, since GMA is splitting it with United. Gerhard. I guess I don't I don't read it that way. Could you elaborate a little each bit? Each invoice more? shall equal and shall be in an equal amount with the total for each year, not to exceed FCGMA's annual funding commitment. Well that's not true because the budget is GMA's funding commitment plus United's funding commitment, correct? It's fifty fifty. It's a fifty sharing. fifty on the the person, the total cost of the person, uh, including benefits, right. and that would be split half, fifty percent. For me, that seems like a shortfall in the wording. It doesn't. It's, it seems to me to be saying it's GMA's annual funding commitment. When I think that I'm reading this differently than you are. Can I tell you how I'm reading it? Go ahead. Uh, with this sentence only, it says each invoice. United is, is submitting an invoice, but only for the amount that Fox Canyon. GMA owes, so the invoice wouldn't show the total cost of the employee and the benefits. It would only show uh, the, the GMA's portion. So therefore, it should be in an amount with the total for each year not to exceed the GMA's annual funding commitment. That's the way I read it. They wouldn't submit an invoice for their own portion of it. That makes sense. If I'm uh, the only one reading it that way, then I'll withdraw my uh, problem with it. Okay. I think we've I think we've talked about this uh, at United, and we've talked about it here. I think it's clear to everybody that we're splitting this cost 50/50, and the GMA's commitment is not to exceed their annual funding that they've agreed to. Now, if the bills come in other than that then I think that's not what we agreed to and we'll all know it, right? So I think the wording is okay. You okay with that, Dave? I'm okay with it. Okay. All right. So... Second. Motion to second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, so move. All right. Let's deal with uh, item number three. Move 
Second. Okay, a motion to second. Um, Dana's not here because she's up uh, north at a water meeting. Um, we had a, at the last United meeting, um, she got honored by a whole bunch of folks from different agencies for her work. And I think it's important that we, it, it's important that we reflect on somebody who truly brought, I think, to our little water community a sense of cooperation and peacemaking. Uh, John, you all remember um, that we went through a series of litigations, internal water wars, there's water wars up and down the state. We seem to have peace among all the major water agencies. We all understand that we are got to solve these problems together. And I think a lot of that harmony between the cities, the water agencies, the M&I folks, the ag community has been a result of Dana's ability to defuse the situation, walk in, understand the problem. When we hired her, uh, Dan Nauman, and uh, Dan's not here today, but Dan said at one time, we hired a general of the generals, because each of our managers are good in what they do, and we had a general that oversaw their operations. And she, I think, has operated that way in her tenure at United and for this uh, community. So I'm pleased that United honored her. I'm pleased the GMA is honoring her. She is truly a, a gifted manager in the things that she does. So. The Board of Supervisors uh, honored her yesterday. Yeah. But I hope we can do it here at the board meeting and present the resolution um, next time. Or can we? Uh, her official retirement is at the end of this month, but uh, we can get her to come back to a meeting. We'll offer cookies or something, uh, <laughs> a trophy or whatever. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Anybody else? Any other comments? I just have one thing to add. I did get a call from Rob Sawyer, who could not attend, and he wanted to express his support for uh, Great. this resolution. Yeah, excellent. All right, let's, uh, let's do it with a roll call, because I think it's that important. Yes. Director yes. Director yes. Director Kelly? Yes. Director Borchardt? Yes. Okay, very good. All right, let's deal with uh, item number four. <clears throat> good afternoon, Chair Mohart and directors. I'm going to take a few minutes and present this follow-up from our July 23rd board hearing to you. During the July 23rd board hearing, staff presented an amended resolution to you regarding the meter calibration issue. And our recommended resolution amendment was not adopted, and it spawned some discussion and some modifications. I think one of the, the main things that the board did not care for was the recommendation that the requirement that the meters owned by the small well owners not be calibrated. There we go. Okay. So there were a few modifications that were made. The first one was that a five-year cycle for meter calibration checks be authorized, providing that 10 acre feet or less is extracted from the well over a five-year period on average. And that's following the initial calibration check. The second thing was that small well owners are required to conduct a calibration check after 10, excuse me, after 10 years. And the third key was that all wells that are required to have flow meters be, or have a calibration check now, that no waiver be granted for meter calibration. And this is our recommended new language for the amended resolution. Do I need to read it to put it into the record, or no. shall I just discuss it? Okay, so you can see I've, I've underlined the word required. This will help 
some people who might have a meter on a domestic well. However, uh, domestic wells aren't required to have flow meters, so if somebody has a meter on a domestic well, they won't be required to have it calibrated. Then the next block of text that is underlined is, of course, the language I've added that discusses the five-year averaging and the fact that after the initial five years following the calibration, if during that time frame the well extracts 10 acre feet or less of water per year, then the waiver can be applied or an additional application for the waiver can be made by the well owner to extend that period an additional five years. But after 10 years, it has to undergo a calibration check again. And that, that summarizes it. And I'm prepared to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Um, questions? Okay. Um, th this is, I, as I recall, this is exactly what we agreed to at the last meeting, and you put it down in uh, the way we wanted it. So let me ask anybody in the audience have any questions? Everybody knows know what we're going to do here. Okay. Uh, motion to uh, adopt. Mr. Chairman, I move that we um, adopt uh, amended resolution 2008-4. We rescind resolution number 2006-1 per staff's recommendation. It's exactly as what I what we had proposed. Second. Motion a second. Any other discussion? Comments? Rob, this is your chance. You've been gone for two months, and I can't get you to come up here and speak to us. Something's wrong. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? <coughs> uh, a roll call on this one, please. Hi. Yes. Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, item number six. Lynn, may I? Yeah. For those of you who've been here uh, through this discussion of small well owners, um, Mr. Fuller, who was a frequent speaker on behalf of this, uh, was one who lost his son in the uh, train wreck. And, oh, my uh, goodness. Uh, he's, I don't see him here today, but uh, uh, it's, uh, he was well thought of, uh, uh, by all accounts, uh, was the air controller, I believe, for Burbank. In any event... Um, that was all in the note and the uh, obituaries. Oh my goodness! Wow. I'm sorry. Did you want item five or item six? Four and five. Um, I'm sorry. Item five. Thank yeah, you. my mistake. Item five. Good afternoon, M Mr. Chair, members of the board. David Panaro, uh, agency hydrologist. Um, got an easy one for you here today. Before you, you should have a ballot for LAFCO alternate director position. Um, this is something we do every once in a while for them, and um, in the interests of expediency here, I would suggest or propose an open motion um, as opposed to a closed ballot process, but we do have to have a majority to make this happen, and then I would ask that you um, approve the resolution that's required by LAFCO, and then we can go ahead and send your vote to them by certified mail as required under their legislation and operating okay. conditions. All right. Uh, just for the uh, uh, information item, uh, United did uh, nominate Bruce Dandy, our board president, uh, since that nomination, I've been informed by staff that Bruce's schedule is so massive between what he has to do at the city and with us that he's actually would like to withdraw his name. So, um, anyway, uh, I would uh, I, I would nominate uh, Gail Pringle uh, I'll from PAs. I move for the question. Okay, motion is second, and uh, all in favor of Gail Pringle from uh, Kiegas? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none. Okay, there's your Thank answer. You. Okay. All right, let's deal with item number six. Good afternoon, Chair Mohart, board members. My name is Gerhard Hubner, Watershed Protection District. I'll be doing a short introduction. Uh, for this presentation and subsequently you'll have howling representatives uh, that will provide more information on this particular item. In late 2007, early 2008, agency staff became aware of intense groundwater extractions by howling nurseries in excess of howling's historic allocation. 
In addition, calculations provided by Howling Nursery indicated that they did not qualify for the irrigation efficiency under the agency's ordinance number 8.1. I've included a map. This question came up, uh, was directed at me actually with the Las Postas user group meeting this morning, so I thought this would be helpful. Um, hopefully you can see in, basically in the center of the map where Howling Nursery is located. Um, it's within Pleasant Valley Water District's uh, there's a there. Sure. I can't tell where it is. It's the yellow box in the middle of the yellow box. Okay. <laughs> you got better eyes than I do, and these glasses don't help with this. <laughs> Technology is killing me. I see the dot. Ah, okay. Right there. 101 is right up there. Okay. So, uh, if you look at the historical allocations and reductions that have occurred over time, uh, 1991 at 100%, they had 319 uh, acre feet. Uh, subsequent reductions, if you go follow down the chart and you look at the 2005, which is scheduled to occur, as you know, this upcoming January, they have 255 acre feet of historical allocation. Currently, they're at 271. This is a uh, table of uh, the self-reported extraction and surcharge liability, the calculations. I'm not going to go through each individual number. Uh, this next slide essentially summarizes that chart. We can go back to that chart if you have any questions. So if you look at groundwater extractions versus allocation over time, and the time period is 2005 to 2008, uh, they had approximately 3,000 acre feet of self-reported extraction. Um, their allocation was 813 uh, in total historical allocation. You do that subtraction, that gets you to 2176. Uh, and then you do the calculation on with the surcharge liability, and that gets you to the one million five hundred and seventy-five thousand. That's not quite right. I don't think you heard that was their total, uh, but we only went back three years to get the okay. The one point that that doesn't equal twenty-one seventy-six. If you go back to the earlier slide, you can see that um, the extraction. I think was no, he's correct. That's just related to that period. Oh, just those three years. Right. Those three years. Okay. So, a little bit of background. In June of this year, the Ventura County Planning Commission uh, approved a conditional use permit allowing Howling Nurseries to construct two additional greenhouse structures. These additional st structures will, as you can imagine, increase water use beyond what they currently use. Subsequently, agency staff and Howling Nursery entered into a series of discussions. Uh, for the payment of groundwater extracted above their historical allocation and the nursery's plans for to meet its future water demand. I just included a few pictures here. They're not, uh, I'm sure Howling Nursery probably will have uh, additional ones to just get you an idea of their operations. Uh, it's, a, it's a vertical operation. Tomatoes is what's grown. Uh, big processing operation, uh, as you can see from the photos and producing uh, quite a bit of tomatoes. Uh, picture here, I guess the most illuminating one is the, the greenhouses that they use, the large greenhouses. So uh, why are we here today? Well, besides the fact that we have this outstanding balance, uh, Howling Nursery representatives requested time at a future GMA board meeting to discuss their operations and plans for obtaining additional water supply supplies to support their nursery expansion. To date, they've been very cooperative and agreed to work with the agency and the agency staff to resolve these issues, including posting a 1.6 million letter credit. Uh, and those representatives are here today to provide that status report. And that concludes my presentation. Okay. Uh, Chair Mulhart, if I may, I believe we're about to hear from the representatives representatives of Howling, but just to remind the board that this matter is also on calendar for a closed session 
uh, this afternoon, and uh, this, as I understand it, is an informational item. If the board has any questions of Howling, those certainly should be asked, but in terms of any substantive discussion of a resolution of this item, I would um, recommend that those take place in closed session. Okay. All right. Everybody got that? All right. Do you have the speaker list? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, the, uh, for you folks, uh, we, we've run this as a town hall meeting, a very, it's, it's a discussion. So I'm not going to put time limits on you. I'm going to le let you use your best judgment. We need to understand the problem. But as council said, I, I, I don't think we're going to get into a discussion back and forth. It's an informational item for us. So you know the individuals that would like to speak. You can go in what order you'd like. Um, to make your presentation, and as I said, uh, use your. When you see us falling asleep, we probably went too long. If we're still awake, we're doing good. So, okay, let's do that. Good afternoon, Chair Mulhard and board members. Nancy Kirsten Schweiner, Nordman, Carmody, Heron, Compton, and today I have the pleasure of representing Howling Nurseries. Howling Nurseries is actually one of the most state-of-the-art and innovative facilities in our county. Howling is one of the largest greenhouse facilities in the county. Howling has explored and is pursuing receiving water from Pleasant Valley County Water District, which will re uh, reduce its pumping capacity as well on its own wells and being able to use water from the Conejo Creek project, which Pleasant Valley receives through Cayegas. Howling also provides currently a number of public health and safety benefits through its operations of greenhouses. It currently grows tomatoes on the vine predominantly in the greenhouses. And as, as some of you may be aware, that type of tomato species can only be grown in greenhouses, cannot be grown in field operations. And as we've seen recently with the recent tomato scare, um, tomatoes on the vine were one of the products that were specifically listed as safe to eat, and that's because of its operation in a greenhouse and growing in a greenhouse facility. Also, Howling, and it's with the current technology that we'll be explaining to you that they're going to have within this facility, has additional public benefits in that they don't utilize herbicides or fertilizers in, that will go into the, into the ground and ultimately into the groundwater in the aquifer. As a result of that, it's, it's an additional public health and safety benefit to the community. Howling is also one of the largest property tax and tax revenue generators in the county, and it provides an excellent opportunity for um, employees, providing additional benefits as well as salary um, to farm workers within the community. What we would like to do today is provide you information concerning the water usage that's anticipated with the new facilities and the new technology and innovations that are going to be um, built into these facilities and retrofitting of the existing facilities. Um, <coughs> excuse me. It has not actually been until recently that Howling became aware of the extraction issue. Um, it's always been providing its water usage data to GMA. It was not until after the project had been approved uh, by the Planning Commission, gone through an entire CEQA analysis and commented upon by all entities that the issue of the extraction arose. Um, we would have certainly uh, addressed that issue uh, much sooner if we were aware of it, and it wasn't until um, approximately the middle of July that the extraction issue was raised directly with Howling representatives. And what we'd like to do is explain with this detailed analysis what, what will be happening. We have with us, and this order of presentation will be given to you, and we're trying to keep our pr entire presentation in less than half an hour for you. Um, I have Peter Cummings, who's the Chief Financial Operator for Howling. He will provide background, explain the company objectives, its investment in technology, and resulting anticipated water usage with the investments in the new technology. I also have with us um, Casey Howling, who's Chief Executive Officer and President of the company. And then carrying on a Howling's tradition of, of innovative and new technology and utilizing the, the most current technology, we have with us representatives of uh, PureTech, which is a new state-of-the-art RO system that is going to be installed into these facilities. And they can explain for you better, more data and uh, water savings that will be um, utilized by these operations. 
Um, as you will see, Howling is the type of company that an operation that this county wants. It's good for Ventura County, it's good for California, and it's good for the international agricultural market in that the tomatoes are shipped all over the, all over the world and utilized, and it, it's good for the employees and the sales tax within this particular county. Um, Howling would also like to take this opportunity to invite the board, whether you want to do it collectively or if you would like to individually view the facility. I can tell you everyone that has viewed the facility is, is ultimately amazed at how innovative and, and technologically this operation actually works. Um, what we'd request, and I know it has only been agendized as a informational meeting, but we would request the board um, based upon Ordinance 8.1, specifically Section 5.6.2, which authorizes the board to grant either an exception on a case-by-case -case basis or to utilize the most efficient practices of record for this type of agricultural use. This is a unique and different agricultural use than open land farming. Um, the quantity of product, basically tonnage, is significantly more and the, um, we would request that a new efficiency allocation formula be created for this type of horticultural operation. It's my understanding in speaking with several agronomists and experts in the field that the current formula um, for irrigation efficiency used does not really apply to greenhouse facilities. Uh, there is not currently um, evapotranspiration data for greenhouses. There is also, the calculation should also take into consideration the tonnage per acre based upon it. A significant amount of water actually goes into the fruit product and that should be also calculated. Howling is currently willing to have, be the operation for the tests and conduct the data for this new formula. Um, I think it's something that I've been advised that there are approximately 2,000 greenhouses currently in the county and that it's probably a new formula that should be evolved for greenhouses. And in addition, Howling would request, if possible, that the funds that is provided by the letter of credit, which were given in good faith, uh, if they could utilize those funds towards the new technology, because I think with this new technology and the formula that would be created, that you would actually find that there's a benefit to the aquifer and not a negative to the aquifer. And I'm available for any questions if you need any additional background of how we got here today. Um, I'd be glad to answer those. So anybody have any questions? Uh, okay, we'll, we'll reserve that. Okay, if, uh, and I'll allow Mr. Cummings to come up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Nancy. Um, I'm um, Peter Cummings, and I'm the CFO of Howling Nurseries, so uh, Chairman Ballhart and board members, we're very uh, grateful to have the opportunity to uh, speak with you today about our operation and to tell a bit of our story in terms of how we found ourselves in this position uh, on, uh, on the water issue. Um, so I have prepared a, a brief uh, presentation and um, I hope I'm not too technically challenged here on using this device. So um, first of all, um, our, on our facility, uh, we started uh, building in the Oxnard Plain in 1996 with our first 20-acre facility. And over the next four years, uh, we built it out to a full 84 acres. On a, we have a full quarter section of land, so we were roughly covering half of the uh, area. Uh, our primary products are uh, vine tomatoes which you probably see in your local food stores or the local farmers markets as well. Uh, more recently we've been experimenting with growing uh, long English cucumbers which are the, uh, they're covered in uh, a bit long and slender and quite different than the typical field tomato or field uh, cucumber, cucumbers that you'd purchase. Currently we're, um, we've embarked upon um, a new uh, 40 acre expansion which uh, Nancy referred to um, it's absolutely um, bleeding edge in terms of greenhouse technology. It's a forced ventilation system and we believe that it will have uh, approximately a 20 to 30 percent yield improvement over the technology that we're uh, currently using. And um, this picture was just taken last week. Uh, 
basically you can see the site coverage now. It's basically the the whole facility or the whole most of the land is now covered by the greenhouse. The first phase that was built in '96 was that um, area right over there, and then '97 through 2001 we built uh, these phases out. This phase started in uh, this is the new area. This started in uh, July 1st, and it's we now have plants in it. And this phase will be completed in the lot, later part of October. And um, it's very, very exciting. There really isn't anything like it in the world yet, and we would be uh, delighted to um, show the uh, board uh, how this new facility works. We really do believe it's the future of agriculture for growing uh, tomatoes in particular. So in terms of our water usage, um, the statistics were shown and we have almost no, no dispute with those at all. We've been drawing our water exclusively from the um, Fox Canyon um, GMA aquifers. Uh, we have been drawing approximately a thousand acre feet a year, uh, which is well, uh, well ahead of the uh, historical allocation. Uh, that said, um, the technology that we purchased in the uh, early 90s when we were building it out was the best available technology at the time. It's reverse osmosis technology, technology that we required. It was required to uh, remove the, um, the salinity in the water. And uh, a considerable amount of water was lost through that process of desalination, which actually drove our usage up quite a bit. Um, we have attempted to comply with the um, requirements of the uh, Groundwater Management Agency. We have uh, made timely submission of our uh, meter readings, and we've also uh, made the facility um, available to um, groundwater management staff to come in and examine our processes, uh, which we believe are certainly representative of best practice in the greenhouse industry in terms of irrigation practice and climate management and that type of thing. So uh, just turning to um, our, ex our expansion, uh, it's been in the planning stage for roughly two years. Um, Ventura County uh, did do an EIR. Um, the water part was, I believe, done in conjunction with, with the GMA staff. And um, at the time, this was back in November um, 06, the um, there was uh, the GM. Well, the county indicated that environmental impacts were deemed less than significant, and there was a letter issued on November 16th to that extent. We had um, planning commission approval on June 18th, um, it's the tail end of the, the two-year process. Just, uh, I don't know if I can just ask. Can you explain a little bit in more detail the the water issue with the uh, conditional, conditional use permit application? The, the, we had to, through the whole process of applying for the, um, for the continue, continuous use permit modification, the county staff conducted an environmental impact review, and the GMA, uh, it's my understanding, and I may call upon Nancy just to clarify this, but the GMA staff was requested to comment whether there were any objections on the project going forward, and there was no objection voiced November in mid-November 06. So the, the first instant, instance of objection really happened near the end of the um, public commentary process following the Planning Commission um, approval. So that was the first we'd heard about it, which was I think around June 30th. And uh, that was a bit of a crisis that focused us very intently to try and one, understand the problem and also uh, really over the last several months we've been trying to come up with alternatives that would address our overdraw in a way that was harmonious with the county and the community at large. Um, that's, I'd have to refer to legal counsel for more specific. Um, I can help with that if you'd like. Um, for a number of years the GMA has been using the comment on almost every EIR that comes through that suggests that impacts are less than significant from a groundwater perspective because uh, the project proponents will have to deal with the GMA. 
Um, I don't know why that was done you know, years ago, but when those come in for review, that's typically the comment you see. That's the comment that they saw, and so they thought um, that that's why the CEQA environmental documents, where there was deemed no significant impact. Um, um, the second part of that question is why we haven't been dealing with them. It's more difficult to answer, and you know, during the forensics, I, the, the best I can come up with at the, this point in time was that we thought that they had been operating efficiently, meeting the efficiency criteria in the ordinance. And there were a couple of years, I think, where there were um, calculations submitted for a couple of years that showed them efficient. And there was assumption that they were operating efficiently, and it came to our attention this year that that was not the case. So that's how it was missed on our end. Okay. All right. Hey, that's that's what happened from our perspective. Well, that's, that's fine. Okay. Um, so the issue that we're confronted with and that we're we, we intend to deal with is the existing water allocation that we have is insufficient for our operations demand. Um, so that's one issue that we've got to deal with. And the second thing that Nancy spoke to was that uh, there is no efficiency standard against which our operation can be uh, held accountable to, I guess, like any other farm operation. And I mean, we're rather unique, so it doesn't particularly surprise us. But that, that is an issue from our perspective. So I just wanted to articulate what our values and objectives are because because I think it's important. First of all, we do want to be fully compliant with all state and uh, county regulations. We have not done overdrawn um, intentionally or with a desire to uh, to abuse the system. So we wanted to make that abundantly clear. And we do want to be viewed as a responsible user of water uh, in Ventura County. And I think another thing we want to do is we want to align ourselves with the future direction of the state at large in that in the, Clearly, water is a very scarce resource, and it's, we're anticipating that there's going to be uh, more regulation and more restraints imposed upon people and how they opt businesses such as ours that use water. So we, we do want to be a good citizen, a good farm citizen in this community. In terms of water usage, um, just some summary data. Um, we have what well, we've got, our, our existing operation, our projected, and by way of reference, we've tried to get some field data just so that you could compare our productivity in terms of using the water versus a traditional field tomato operation. Uh, right now we have um, <coughs> we have 84 acres. We're producing close to 30,523 uh, 30, tons of tomatoes a year and our water usage is about a thousand um, acre feet a year. So for our productivity we think is a, a good a good measure is uh, is roughly 0 0.0328 uh, acre feet per ton of product. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our, about our projected use, but we're going up to 124 acres. Our tons of product output we expect to go up to uh, around 49,000 tons. And with the technology changes that I'll talk about in a moment, we're going to hopefully going to go down to about 584 acre feet a year or 0 0.0119 acre feet per ton, which represents about a 64% reduction on our use. By way of contrast, one acre field production turns out about 50 tons of tomatoes annually. Their water demand um, is, is, uh, is about um, uh, 1.75 acre feet per year. It's, uh, and they only produce for six months, so it's, it's about 0 0.035 acre feet in a six month period. We doubled it to annualize it out. The land is typically used for alternative uses, so we've assumed 0 0.07 acre feet in a typical tomato uh, field operation. In terms of dealing with it, our, the, we've We've developed a number of water use, usage strategies. First of all, um, we're going to be replacing all of our water treatment uh, equipment with state-of-the-art equipment. Uh, this is going to reduce water loss due to desalination from about 40% of what we draw down to 15%. So that's about a 42% improvement. And that will save us 375 acre-feet a year. The next major initiative that we're going to do is right now our 
all of our drainage from the greenhouse basically <laughs> escapes into the drainage ditches around the greenhouse. So we're going to start recirculating all of that, all of that overdrain, including the condensation that forms inside the greenhouse, and that will uh, reduce our uh, consumption by 459 acre feet per year. I should say a lot of this technology, if it was available at all, it was financially it wasn't affordable uh, even five years ago. So there's been a tremendous improvement in technology, and the reason we can move forward with on it is that it's available, and secondly, it's, it's, it's economic now to do it. The next strategy that we're going to employ is that uh, we're going to recapture rainwater from our greenhouse roofs, and uh, that will, uh, that's assuming about eight inches per acre foot per year. There's actually 13.1 acres or inches per Per, uh, of rainfall in our area, but we, we've assumed 8 inches, we should capture 80, 82 acre feet. Um, we are hoping that uh, Fox Canyon will increase our allocation to something that's more uh, in accordance with what our actual usage is, but assuming not, we have been having discussions with uh, Pleasant Valley to obtain uh, water through that source as well. So in terms of, just so you can get a better sense of what we're using, right now, our existing facility, if we continue to do what we're doing, we would, we're consuming the 1,000 acre feet that everybody's agreed to. With the expansion, if we continue to use the same technology, we would be using another 500 acre feet per year. So we are going to put in this new technology to, um, to clean up the water. That will reduce it by 375 acre feet a year. The rainwater capture that we'll capture off the roofs will reduce it by another 82, and the recirc and drain 459 acre feet reduction. So, this is how we get down to the 584 acre feet that we can operate the business on with the expansion and employing this new technology. So, my final slide here um, we, we are. Um, basically committed to moving forward with this water treatment equipment. It's, it's um, a cost of roughly 3.1 million and our goal is to have it in place by March 31. Um, the one thing with respect to the uh, overcharge penalty that we've been assessed, um, had we known that we were so far out of the line we would have taken action sooner. Um, we apologize for that. Um, it does impose a financial hardship on us. We are having to scramble around to uh, get extra financing to move forward with the um, with this water treatment equipment. But we are, we're going to move forward regardless, but we would ask your indulgence in either eliminating or reducing this charge to uh, basically offset some of the costs. And the last thing that we would ask um, is that a water, a proper water efficiency rating be established for our um, greenhouses. So that concludes my uh, brief presentation. Uh, I could answer any questions or alternatively we have uh, a representative of WaterTech here who can explain, he has a very, very brief presentation just explaining some of the technology that we're going to be utilizing um, uh, hopefully by the end of the next, uh, the first quarter in uh, 2009. Any members have any questions? Anybody in the audience have any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Since this is a town hall sort of a meeting, my name is John Saren and I am from PureTech. Uh, I'm the president uh, CEO uh, and we are basically a comprehensive water treatment and service company. Um, the interesting part, I've been in front of quite a few water agencies and regional uh, boards talking about water for years. We've invested probably close to $10 million in research and development with respect to water technologies and understand the concept that it isn't just about putting out a piece of equipment out to an agricultural or nursery or communities that are involved in water issues. Uh, we know it's been a problem for years so we took on an approach over the years of understanding all water technologies and developed into a 
company that not only does the initial engineering consulting and understanding what the water problems are within a specific uh, agricultural organization, we also move ahead and do the manufacturing assembly and integration of these systems and just as importantly the service mo maintenance and monitoring to the, to, so that we can be more diagnostically responsible for systems even, even when before they even break down. We're able to see on a computer screen uh, flow is down or a generator is down or uh, a membrane is having some issues. We can respond to those in a much quicker method. We've been working with uh, uh, Casey and Howling Nurseries uh, for a period of time and their present objectives um, to move forward with some probably the best management uh, uh, technology that's available would be uh, they want to reduce their water usage and will reduce their water usage by an average of 400 acre feet per year. Uh, they'll be able to reuse uh, treated water to maximize product efficiency in the operation of the recycling from their greenhouses we're going to be working on removal of pathogens uh, because I'm sure uh, anyone you'll know any pathogens in any greenhouse or any sort of an agricultural uh, product will have some detrimental effects to the entire product and we'll also economize the use of fertilizers and water volume usage uh, it, is, it will be the intention by reducing the use of fertilizers through the recycling method that we're also going to be reducing the carbon emissions. Um, they're really, they want to project themselves and without a doubt that they will uh, be a leader in the industry for water conservation practices. The project scope uh, for Howlings it will be the conversion to new technology that optimizes the best available management practices in the industry. Uh, they'll do this in two different uh, methods. One will be through the nanofiltration system, which is uh, a membrane system familiar with the use of RO. Uh, this will be for the purposes of treatment of the groundwater due to the high salinity. Then the ultrafiltration, another membrane type technology, and ozonation uh, will be for the purposes of treatment of pathogens and recycle from a variety of collection sources. The proposed solution will be a pretreatment uh, by sand filter and multimedia filters. And I have my uh, vice president of engineering here, so if you want to afterwards get into any sort of a technical questioning, whether it's from the board or out to the audience, he is available. Uh, then uh, there will be storage of filtered water. Uh, both from the overdrain and uh, for an overdrain means the water coming out of the uh, greenhouses. Uh, there will be a treatment, uh, I just talked about that, um, then there will be a treatment of purchased water by nanofiltration. This is a conceptual layout of what the system uh, will look like uh, with the uh, tanks and in front of that will be a concrete pad where our systems will go the, just a, a quick uh, brief overview of the technologies, the ultrafiltration and ozonation technology is a low pressure membrane technology, which is the ultra, and a residual disinfection system, which would be the ozone system, that will remove and kill pathogens and microorganisms to desired levels from the water. Um, it's interestingly enough, Casey and uh, Howling Nurseries uh, are taking some gigantic steps to collect water and the, where they're going to collect their water is from the greenhouses, uh, from the rainwater, from the wash water, as well as from the dew. The nanofiltration system, which is also a membrane technology and will be used to reduce harmful salts, uh, chloride, sodium, etc from the existing well on the property now and also the potential water allotment from Pleasant Valley Water District. And this would be from, I think they've got about 10 different wells uh, where they're pumping it into as well as surface water. What 
Howling Nursery is going to do with this new technology is really be at the forefront of conservation practices, not only in Ventura, California, but throughout the country, if not the world. Uh, they will meet the standards of the Natural Resources Conservation Service Tailwater Recovery Program. Uh, we know about that quite well at Pyrotech because we have a member on the Technical Advisory Board of that organization. And not only do we assist the uh, growers in writing uh, grants to get funding or in a cost sharing method with NRCS, uh, but we also sit on the board and uh, deal with specs and standards uh, that have to do with uh, tailwater recovery. Uh, it will also meet the standards of the Porter Cologne Act of 2002, as well as meeting the standards of the Clean Water Act. Um, we as a company have been involved in working on environmental issues for a period of about seven years. Um, in November 2003, we received the Environmental Responsibility Award from the organizations uh, mentioned uh, on that slide. As well, uh, we worked with a premier colored nursery in Fallbrook, California. This is a potted plant uh, grower, and they, uh, through our tailwater recovery system, won the Environmental Awareness Award uh, from the NRCS in August of 2004. Uh, do you have any questions uh, here to answer? I have one question. Yes, ma'am. If uh, this uh, company were to participate in the Cayegas Cam Rosa Recycled Water Project, would that water ha still have to be treated? Could you give me that question again, please? Okay. Um, maybe it's a, co a representative of the company then that should be asked this. But one potential source of water is one you mentioned, and that's uh, Pleasant Valley. Uh, from, from well water. Another potential source of water is a Cayegas Camarosa recycled water program. Is If they were to participate in that program, would that water have to be, if you're not familiar with it, then it wouldn't be appropriate to answer the question. Well, I don't know about the recycled program, okay. uh, but you know, if the water is clean enough uh, for the product, uh, there would no, there would be no reason to treat it. It's all about what the product can take. No, I, I understand okay. all that. I was just wondering if you were familiar with that no. source. And if, okay, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, uh, let me ask. Uh, are you guys going to? Uh, are you going to make any comments about the issue of PV, PV water? The, uh, my only, okay, Mike has that. My only question is, are you guys going to pump, John, are you guys proposing to pump against your credit bank? John Matthews, Pleasant Valley County Water District. Um, we would provide the water to him from pumped pumped water as well as surface water received through the Cayugas Camarosa TAP program. So it, it, would there be, would your usage require that you have to dip into your credit bank to, to meet that? It would obviously it? depend on the year, depend on the rainfall and whatnot. Because um, uh, if, if, if we have a program designed to dip into the credit bank, we're not solving this problem. We're just shifting pumping patterns. Well, a, as most of you are aware, Pleasant Valley is a supplemental water provider. So we would not be guaranteeing a specific amount of water to, to Howling Nurseries. We've met with them and cooperated with them. They've been very cooperative with us. We're exploring options to do it, but uh, Director Kelly, I would agree, we would not want to put a, be put in a position where we'd be using uh, credits uh, to meet these water needs. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, obviously they need to find a new source of water. I encourage them right. to chat with PV. PV has been a great steward of what we're doing in this agency and the biggest problem area, as you well know, is right under your right. doorstep. So I'd have real concerns if all we're doing is shifting pumping patterns. Right. Because and I, that's a shell game. And again, we, have we haven't gotten down to the okay. actual numbers and whatnot, but I guess my response is kind of a nebulous one. It's one, again, that it's a supplemental water supply. We have limitations per acre on the amount of uh, water people can use. The howling is within our within our district, and uh, providing them supplemental water would be one of our mission statements. Okay, but I appreciate the concern, and we would yeah, watch as long that. As, as long as you're aware of what my yep. concern, our concern yep. would be. Okay, yep. thanks, John. Just ask yeah. Question, maybe John. Um, 
Well, not of John. Okay. Of Jeff, maybe. Or, Thanks. Or anyone. On the intersection of the 82 acre feet that was mentioned, um, identified as a water source, do um, you see any issues there with that? Uh, I don't know what rainfall they used, but I think we're showing that over the period of 1993 to 2007, about 16 inches of rain per year in that area. Uh, I think so. I assume that uh, when I talked with Casey, we were thinking 10 to 12 might be. It, overall, in Cayuse Watershed, we see 10 to 12, but closer to the coast, it gets a little higher. So, I, I, do you know what you guys use? We cut it in half so we can serve it and we can save it. Yeah, so that sounds like that. that Okay. All right. Any other questions? Uh, my oh, question yeah. is, there you don't see any issues there other than that, that it's doable. There's no issues there as far no, as intercepting uh, the water. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to get the fishing game, or <laughs> hey, okay. that's where you're going. That, yeah, that's outside my area. Um, well, hold on a second, uh, Steve. Um, Mr. Howling, did you want to speak? Yeah. Why don't we do that? Let's not get off track here. Let them finish their presentation. So we'll do that. All right. First, first of all, I just want to say uh, thank you to the chair and uh, Could board. Could you state your name? So yeah, it has to go. So the rest of us know. <laughs> yeah. Casey Howling from uh, President and CEO of Howling Nurseries. Uh, I'll reiterate and start again. Uh, thank you for allowing us to have this presentation here to the chair and to the board members and to everyone here who's listening. Um, I'm not going to go over much of what we're already doing. I think that was clarified well enough in the in the presentations before me. But what I would like to say is, um, as part of this community, we've been here since '96. We are a Canadian company, and uh, we take that very seriously. Uh, uh, being operating down here and having the privilege to be here, it's a, it's a great area. It's a great county. Uh, I would say all in all we've been treated very well here in spite of the uh, the hurdles that we have had to go through to get our building permits through and the processes uh, through this this whole thing but having said that we um, not only are we proud to be here but we're also proud of our facility which is truly one of the uh, world top leading facilities in the world this new expansion that we're building it's uh, built under our own patent it's uh, pressurized greenhouse technology that we've developed ourselves, and it's being watched from every corner of the world. So this, this whole water technology thing that, that you've seen in these presentations before fits into what our goals are uh, as being responsible in uh, community members and responsible to, uh, to not only the U.S. but also to the rest of us in the world. Uh, we are also, besides this water technology improvements and on reducing our water to a point where we're actually utilizing over 100% of the water, including rainwater and everything else, so there is virtually zero waste compared to from what we're doing right now. The only waste that we will have is some of the water that comes off the, uh, the nanofiltration to remove the salts. And the reason that's so important to remove those salts is because once you implement a recirculation system, Plants don't use, tomato plants don't use salt. So your levels will build up to toxic levels. So that's why we have to do it. And it's, and it's an expensive, it's a big, it's a big expense. It's three, over $3 million for us uh, for, for uh, ability to store rainwater and all the other recirculation water besides all the filtration and the maintenance to operate in these things. So it's not a small fee. But besides this, we're also doing... Uh, uh, generating, we're putting in one meg of solar uh, generating capacities to generate our own electricity. We're doing some solar uh, uh, thermal technology that we're putting in. Uh, so we're very, very excited about this, and I think the community should be too. So um, we will be having an open house once this thing is all uh, is all completed to basically do a tour to uh, to uh, a number of people that really want to see this. But I would I would also uh, want to reiterate that. Any of you are welcome in the interim if you would like to have a, a tour of the facility. Uh, I think that would be very helpful. So having said that, uh, thanks once again, and I, uh, I appreciate you uh, dealing with this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, before you leave, Mr. Allen, anybody have any questions? Okay. Thank you. Let me... Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Is there any, uh, Nancy, or is there any, any other summation or anything is that you, you folks are done? It's up to you before I go to the audience.
Okay. Um, Steve, you want to speak? When we, uh, Steve, for so the day, everybody knows yeah, who you Steve are. Steve Bachman, United Water. Um, when we did the management plan, um, the potential for increased water use per acre was mentioned in there, but it wasn't highlighted. <laughs> And um, I think I was remiss in doing that. Um, I think mostly because we didn't know that we were going to have the issue on us so fast. And it's a tricky issue because in one hand, we obviously want to have agriculture competitive. And to have agriculture competitive, some of these kinds of processes are obviously the way that agriculture is going to have to go. At the same time, that bumps up against the reality of there's a limited amount of water in the aquifer and that we're overdrafting it currently. So um, we clearly have to <laughs> mesh those two pieces somehow. And um, you know, we've had some discussions, um, and some of the board members were there um, uh, with some a professor from Cal Poly who said that the irrigation efficiency calculations would be you know, very difficult in where in greenhouses you'd have to almost have a separate calculation for each one with its own weather station. I think this goes beyond that though. I don't think that with this kind of water use we can sustain it by counting on aquifer water. Um, I think it has. I think the water for these operations are going to have to be shared between the aquifer and imported and recycled sources. So um, you just happen to have this one, you know, sitting right now, and it's always tough to be the first one <laughs> out of the out of the shoot on this one. But I think that this is a really a broad policy issue that the GMA is going to have to deal with, because I think this one's going to be right on us really fast, and um, it it it's going to be a problem. I think we're going to have to have some kind of resolution on this, whether or not it's, and I don't think efficiency, the way we're using it, the way we could use it is going to solve this problem. I think we're going to have to look at some other way of either having a cap on efficiency or something based when you go over a certain amount based on historical allocation. There's going to have to be some other way to, to look at this because no matter what our great feelings are about this, the aquifer has a limitation, and we know what that limitation is. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Anybody else? Uh, Sam? <clears throat> Sam McIntyre with uh, Soma Specific. Soma. What, the one thing I really want the board to take a close look at is that uh, the future of agriculture, especially in the Santa Rosa Valley, uh, the Somos area, Moore Park, where water costs are going to be more than 50% increase before January 1st, 2010, with the cost of, of all the costs involved, the fertilizer, diesel, no matter what it may be, and ag, a lot of those crops are going to change, and they're going to change to new entities that are similar to these people. They may not use quite as much water as this operation might use, but they're going to use more water than we're using right now. So I, I would like this to be an open procedure. The information from the university published for ag to look at, all ag, not just the board. I would like for this procedure to realize that it's agriculture, and I heard comments from, from people within the county that this is m and I. It is not m and I. It is ag. And it's a very serious subject. There's going to be, this is just the start of this type of ag. And uh, I know uh, a little bit about the systems they've been discussing. And they're, they're par excellence. They are our future in ag. And they're going to help us bring the cost down. We're going to change the crops so we can make enough income to afford the future and the, and the type of systems they're talking about. So make it an open decision. Let's get in, delve into it, and I don't totally agree with Cal Poly and or the people that you talk about as far as being able to uh, determine efficiency, because the information I receive in our operations in Monterey County is that Davis has some of that information, and I think it can be utilized. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sam, um, can you get to staff uh, if 
you have access to information from Davis, get that to staff or get that to Steve because uh, we're, we're going to have to look at it. And if there's information out there that the Cal Poly professor is not aware of or we're not aware of, let's get that to staff. Will do. Okay, thanks. Uh, anybody else on this item? Uh, let me go to the right side. I knew it. I knew we'd be able to do this. What happened to the laryngitis? What happened to the laryngitis? I'm magically cured. Rob, you, you have to speak. You never can get away without speaking. Even in a dark calendar, I knew you were here. And Rob <laughs> Saperstein for City of Oxnard. I, and I, I, it's just it the is what it is. You know, I, I, have, I have to make a purpose for myself. So. There you go. So, and, and, and this is sort of a smattering of issues from maybe from the MI side and some specifically for City of Oxnard. Uh, boy, uh, start, a, start with a positive and then some of the things that concern us. I think we ought to, as a group, do everything we can to encourage some of the, the forward thinking these folks have in trying to be proactive and when faced with a problem, be as innovative and, and technology driven as, and as creative as they've been in trying to make their project fit within our mold. That's, it's pretty challenging at best. Um, so I, you know, this is not like the problem we faced a couple of years ago, where we had recalcitrants and really worried about litigation. Uh, we have what appears to be very cooperative folks that want to solve a problem, and that's the kind of conduct we ought to encourage generically. The, the and there there are, are some tremendous potential opportunities, I think. And here's where City of Oxnard has a more of a long-term solution. A couple different ways that I would offer to these folks to participate. I think rather than not just the Canal Creek project, but recycle water directly from the great program solves the problem, solves the concern that Dr. Bachman raised that this takes them off the aquifer system entirely. The challenge is the first phase of the great program isn't intended to get all the way to PV initially. It would take some initial pretty substantial investment to get it to where these folks are located. So a longer term op opportunity, perhaps it can come sooner rather than later if we can divert some money rather than penalties into capital infrastructure to get recycled water into the heart of PV where it's desperately needed. Um, and, and so as a way, by way of invitation, AWA has started a recycled water committee. John Matthews is on it. We have some of the local farm your representatives and we're desperately seeking folks that from the agricultural community that have some interest in innovative uses of reclaimed and recycled water to populate that committee. So I'd invite whomever it is from these folks if they have the time and energy to contact either Kelly Pistoni or, or Tony Emirates in, in the audience from City of Oxnard to, to see if there's some synergy there. Uh, because it, it is a longer term potential way to get them off the basin. The worry is exactly what, what Dr. Bachman mentioned. Uh, we, they're pumping from exactly the place we do not want over pumping to occur. And, and uh, so that's the challenge. Uh, and, and they're even at best with the full efficiency in place, they're overusing by double their historical allocation. And there's just kind of no getting around that and that's a concern. As they sit right now, the 5% cutbacks that this board imposed on M&I folks generically have now, have now just evaporated. The benefit from the imposition of those cutbacks goes away by virtue of that over water use by one entity. You know, call it 1,500 acre feet or thereabouts. It's one entity that neutralizes all of the benefits obtained by the 5% cutbacks. That's a problem. Um, uh, the, one of the issues that I haven't heard address, addressed, and, and, um, and maybe it's a non-issue, I don't know where that brine waste is going that, that's coming from the RO treatment of this water. Maybe minor in the scheme of things. They may be in the confined portion of the basin where it's just flowing into Cayugas Creek and out to the ocean, but I, I haven't heard any discussion of, of of where where that ends up with respect to impacts on water quality. Um, generically, though, I think there's a real opportunity from the behavior in which these folks are, are bringing to the agency. I, I just would hate to see the board um, 
make a, a short-term decision on penalizing them when they're doing what appears to be everything they can to be to work with the agency to come up with a, a workable solution. <coughs> okay, thanks. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Peter Finn, I'm currently with PureTech Inc. Uh, previously, I spent 17 years with the Ohio State University working in research in greenhouses. I'm an agricultural engineer. This is a somewhat ad hoc presentation, but I've heard a lot about so-called water efficiency during my discussions with the Howling people, and I've heard a lot about it this afternoon. We just heard that Howlings is using double the amount of water that they should be using, that they're producing at least 10 and probably 20 times the tonnage of product that would be produced in a field. If Ventura County decided that they would produce tonnage of crop, they could use a fraction of the water they produce now, but they'd have to build a lot of greenhouses all over the current fields because the greenhouse production capability is far in excess of that of field crops. It's not only in excess from a tonnage perspective, it's in excess from a quality perspective. Most of the tomatoes I see growing out there in the field are going to go into your ketchup. Every tomato he grows goes into, onto your table. This is huge when it comes to the monetary side of things from the point of view of money coming into Ventura County. I would urge you as a committee that when you look at the business of efficiency of water use, look at the efficiency of water use as it applies to the amount of product that you produce. The current equations that I see are we will judge you on the basis of an ET equation we will judge you on the basis of an allocation. You can allocate me one acre foot on my acre. If I use half of that to grow nothing, I've done really well. If I use two acre feet to grow a ton of crop, I've done really badly under the way in which you measure it right now. This has to be taken into account. From the point of view of efficiency in greenhouses, I personally have worked with that. I have spreadsheets that work with that. We know how much water we're going to use in the greenhouse, provided we know the greenhouse environmental conditions. That is, where is the greenhouse situated? What kind of covering it has? What kind of temperatures and humidities are maintained by the control system? We can tell you very accurately how much water the crop is going to use in that house. If you wish to use that kind of research that came out of Ohio State, I'm happy to help. Okay, very good. All right, thank you. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Chair Mulhart, board members, Nancy Schreiner again. Um, a couple of things. There was a question about uh, credits. It's my understanding about speaking with both Pleasant Valley uh, County Water District and, and United, there are excess state allocations that can be provided to us that have not even been requested by the water agencies. Um, so that would also be an additional source, although we're trying not to do that at this point in time. Um, the question also whether about the brine line, we've had discussions with Cayegas about participating in their brine line, um, and that, that looks very possible. And with respect to whether water would have to be treated through the RO systems, almost all the water would still go through the RO systems. Okay, very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, anybody else have any questions? Any member? Um, first of all, I uh, want to thank you for coming and making a great presentation. It gives the board a, a much better understanding of your operation. Uh, per council, we're, we're, you know, I, I, obviously we can't get into do this, do that. Um, but I think that it would be helpful to you to understand some historical perspective of why we exist. We exist because we were ordered by the state to bring this aquifer into safe yield. For over 75 years, we have been harvesting water off of the Santa Clara River and trying to recharge the aquifer with earthen ditches. My grandfather was part of that 
contingency that started harvesting water on the Santa Clara River, which is really not a river from your world. It's a floodplain. We misnamed it, and it's cost us a lot of money because we misnamed it. People go, ooh, a river. So we've gone from an earthen ditch, part of um, Rose Road was known as Ditch Road when, we, when I grew up as a kid, to now it's pipelines and a whole series of structure that we have created over the years. The process that's in place today is designed to make sure that we recharge the aquifer so we have sustainable agriculture and a sustainable community over time because the truth of the matter is we're in a semi-arid area and water is one of our limiting factors. If we were up in Maine, water is not our problem, snow is the problem, and then you don't have your sun and heat for your greenhouse. So you chose an area that has a water problem. We were mandated by the state to solve this water problem. If we do not solve this water problem, the state will solve it for us and we'll pay the bill. And John led the charge to rally the growers, went grower to grower. I remember him visiting the house with my dad, asking for his support to create this agency and the pumping trough pipeline and the Freeman diversion that we ultimately built. That process has allowed us over our history to recharge the aquifer in the tune of about three and a half million acre feet of water that did not exist but for our local activities and about a million and a half to two million of that acre feet in the last ten years since we put the system in place. This agency's responsibility is to create a level playing field so that the cities and the ag and M&I and the CB base and all the folks that want to make Ventura County their home can live in some kind of harmony. And what our analysis has demonstrated repeatedly is we're in overdraft. We are sucking more water out of the aquifer than we're able to put back in. And the area that we have the biggest problem is right under your nursery. Pleasant Valley's objective has been, ever since I've been involved, and I have known Tommy Viovich, the president of that board, because we were grew up as kids together. His uncle was my godfather. So, I mean, it's one big looped community. Their goal has been to reduce pumping on the on the on the uh, to reduce pumping and try to find a way to have surface delivery and other deliveries to bring that portion of the aquifer back into balance. We created a system that looks at water law, and I'm not going to, we got attorneys in the room and they'll eat me alive if I try to cite water law, but the fact of the matter is, is that when you're in an overdrafted basin, you do not have an unrestricted right to just take water out and put everybody else out of business. So we spent almost three and a half years, John was part of that committee, um, John sat through a lot of the meetings, and we came up with a system to try to bring balance to the aquifer. And one of the ways we did that, after dealing with three and a half years of town hall meetings like this, is we said, let's take the historical perspective of what currently the land and the growers are currently using. That's how the historical allocation came into play. And it was a time frame that was already on the books. So no one had three years going forward to cook the books to come up with some inflated numbers. The numbers were already in. It applies to me as an individual pumper. It applies to all the individual pumpers that are in the room. So then we looked at the issue of how do we balance the city's usage of water with ag's usage of water to give the ag community the opportunity to have crop rotations and cropping patterns because one of the issues that came out of that was the need to have sustainable agriculture in Ventura County. The public has voted for that. Um, we want that as part of our heritage in this county. How do we keep farms in operation when water was the key to it? One of the ways we did it is we created a system of efficiency, and credits. It was totally our creation. And it works. But it doesn't work for nurseries. And we understand that. Now we have a problem. We have had before this board the cities. The city has come, cities have come to us and said, we've got golf courses, we've got parks, we've got 
um, center dividers up and down the streets. And we need to keep those grasses nice and green because it's good for the community. We want efficiency for those golf courses and those parks and those medium strips. The cities elected not to do that. I recall in the discussion, the city of Ventura, Shelley Jones was the public works director, and the issue was, if you have a wealthy city, Beverly Hills, and a poor city, the wealthy city gets to continue to feed their lawns, and the poor city can't do that. So the wealthy city gets better and better because it's a nicer place to live, and a poor city can't even afford to water their parks. So the issue of efficiency does not apply to M&I. So the question is, what do we do with cities as they grow? How do a city solve the problem? And the consensus and the agreement after negotiating up and down the flagpole, and we came up with every possible combination. Let's just give everybody a blanket two acre feet. Let's give them totally what they want. It doesn't work in the opera. What's the solution? The cities have the financial power to replace the water they need when they grow. There is a limit to what they can take out of the aquifer. It's the same limit that, that I as a grower have. And if they want to grow the city, they have to find new water sources. Kiegas, treated water, that's one of the reasons the city of Oxnard is willing to spend in terms of 68, I'm guessing the numbers, Tony would have the numbers, probably a hundred million dollars before they're done to take and treat their water rather than running it out and replacing the pipeline that goes out to the Pacific Ocean. So what you have is, is that the M&I folks have said, if we want to expand our operation, if we want to build tall buildings because tall buildings bring in bigger businesses and they are good for employment and good for the tax base, but they need more water because they sit on an acre of land and we at the GMA only gave them two acre foot allocation per acre, but a 35-story building needs more than two acre feet, you have to solve that, Mr. City, by finding a new source of water. We've had that discussion. We've had golf courses come before us. Satakoy Country Club has been for this board at least 20 times because their numbers are going down and they don't have that source of water and they've made the same kind of adjustments that you folks are making. So what you have is you have a system in place that was put in place to try to balance the legal requirements of rights to water, to give adjustment to the ag community to adjust for usage over time because of cropping patterns, restrictions on the cities that they cannot turn to the aquifer to solve their growth problems. They have to go someplace else because they have the financial clout to do it. And we have a military base that pays nothing for the water they take because they get a federal government dispensation and we supply their water, essentially, and they pay nothing to recharge it. And we have a system in play that has a finite limit to how much we can collect from a flood river not a real river, a flood river, and put back into the aquifer. So if you take your nursery operation, and I think Sam is right and you're right, it is a change in the cropping pattern, and we're going to have to make some adjustments. We're going to have to think through this, and I'm willing to think through this. The board is willing to think through this, but this is not going to be an easy discussion because of the, the level of the problem. The problem is, if you take your theory and you extend it all the way out, and we take all the open ground out and we turn it into all kinds of nurseries with the kind of numbers that you're proposing, at the end of the process, we have not brought the aquifer into safe balance. And we're in violation of our agreement with the state of California. And no matter what we all say, there is a bigger dog in the fight than this little board. And I do not want to take on the state of California because I will lose. I don't have the time and energy in my years left on this planet. It's easier to bring the aquifer into safe balance. Steve Bachman has looked at this aquifer over the years. The analysis that we just finished and the water management plan we just finished shows that we've gone from a usage of about 160,000 acre feet a year 
down to 120, and even at 120, it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. We have to get down to 100,000 acre feet to make it sustainable. That's the reality of the reservoir that's below your feet. So I appreciate all the technology you bring. It's fantastic. I love state-of-the-art stuff. But at the end, if you're taking more out of the savings account than you're putting into the savings account, you're going broke. And the aquifer is going broke. How do we solve that problem? I don't have before you today an answer to it other than tell you it is a complex issue. And I don't think the intent of the board is to reach out and slap somebody in the head and say, eh, now you go figure it out. Our board has operated for the 24 years that John's been on the board since he started it, and the 22 years that I've been on the board, I think that's the right number, our process has been to try to solve the problem. But in solving the problem, it creates unintended consequences. And some of the unintended consequences could very easily be that we upset the balance on how we adjust allocations for everybody else. And where does that put us? Because one of the other discussions we've had at the board, people have come through. My allocation is not correct. I cannot grow lemons on the allocation you gave me. And we have not changed the allocation. We've not changed the allocation the city's asked for. We have not changed allocations for the lemon folks, uh, the uh, golf course folks. Why? Because you start changing one, the domino effect is you change everybody. And when you start wrapping those allocations up and you add them all back into the total, the aquifer is still out of balance. And that's our problem. Now, Rob and the city of Oxnard have put together, I think, one of the great, in fact, it's called the great program, but it's one of the great water programs that's before us. The problem is, is they don't have a good customer for it. <laughs> that's the problem. That's exactly. They got the water, and they can make it good, and we can build a pipeline, but at the end of that faucet, they do not have a consumer that's willing to pay the kind of numbers they have to pay for that level of water. You may, in fact, be that customer. I don't know. I don't know what the solution is. But I do know that turning to the aquifer and talking about tonnage and all the other issues that say, because your operation creates so much tonnage, therefore you should have more water, then puts in play that if everybody went to that, at the end of the process, we're still sucking the aquifer dry. And that's a problem. I don't know how to get through that. Because, as I said, when it's all said and done, there's the 55,000 pound gorilla, and that's called the state of California. And they have given us great latitude over the last 25 years because we've kept to our nose to the grindstone, grindstone to bring the aquifer back into safe balance. That's our objective. It's not to punish people, but it's to make it fair. And how that plays out, I do not know. But I do know we have to keep the aquifer in balance. And that's going to be our challenge. And I appreciate the, the presentation you made because it gives us an understanding of the level of operation you have. And I applaud you for all the work you've done. And we're going to have to solve this problem. How it plays out, I don't know. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have anything on this issue? Okay? Let's go to the next item, which is item seven. Eight. Out of order. Oh, okay. You want to flip it. Yeah, do it. Item eight. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, members of the board. For the record, Gerard Acoustic Watershed Protection District and GMA staff. Uh, I'm pleased today to give you a brief presentation on the uh, fiscal 0708 year end budget. And I would like to start the presentation this, this uh, afternoon by suggesting to you that due to your board's prescient, fiscally conservative leadership, unlike the Federal Reserve Banking System or the stock markets, the budget of the GMA is both balanced without debt, adequate capital reserves, and your constituents had just been the beneficiaries of a credit refund. No, so no I congratulate you. 
Pardon? No investments in derivatives. And no investments in derivatives. Did we, whatsoever. Invest, did we invest in Lehman Brothers? Just, just come not one AIG. Do we have any money one, in AIG? Not one red cent. And by Thank the way, you, sir. Uh, John, uh, on the Daily Show, John Stewart pointed out an interesting thing the other night. Why didn't AIG buy insurance? <laughs> it's a great question, isn't it? In any event, uh, I, uh, you've, you've had, I don't want to bore you with all the details. How long is your report going to take, is it? Pardon me? How long do you think your report will take? Uh, it can take about five, seven minutes, something like that. I'm going to focus on the slides. In particular, slides number 2, 6, 8, and 11, because they provide you with the year-end information in summary, and they provide it with respect to a historical context. So I'm going to uh, move through the others rather quickly. The bottom line of this slide is at the end of the year, after all revenue and financing sources are accounted for and all actual expenditures, which were less than projected, uh, the agency has approximately uh, just under 1.1 million fund balance, which is about a quarter of a million or 29% more than what we originally projected. There are two significant reasons for that, which we'll get into, but they're essentially more pumping uh, <clears throat> and uh, a double up of the surcharge payment on the Thornhill Miller just because of the, sec the uh, scheduling uh, for two years, and I'll get to that in more detail. This is perhaps the most significant uh, chart in the presentation because it places in context a variety of information uh, that both drives fiscal performance and uh, deals with uh, the relationship of rainfall and pumping and it gets to the underlying question that the chairman so eloquently identified which is the new how are we doing in terms of pumping against the new uh, basin yield target uh, in essence what this chart talks uh, looks at is uh, let me see if I can find that oh, there we go it provides information about rainfall, which, is the, uh, which are the blue bars. It provides information about the actual pumping, which is the red line, or the data points on an annual basis. It specifies the range between the, what was viewed as the old basin yield target of 120,000 acre feet and the new basin yield target, and essentially allows one to look at two critical trends. First, as, as, as expected, when there's high rain, there's usually less pumpage, not rocket science. Uh, and uh, as the executive officer has indicated over these years, the average, the mean of the uh, rainfall in the agency uh, area has been about 16, acre, uh, 16 inches. You can see 2007 was less than one-third of that average. And not surprisingly, pumping in 2007 spiked up. Pumping in 2007, as identified in the, in the data sheets that were attached, was uh, the fourth highest pumping in the 17 years of managed extraction in the agency's history. And as you can see, the trend line of pumping falls within this range of the old and the new safe yield, but not one data point, with the exception of 2001, in which we got close, dropped below the new basin yield. Oops. Essentially puts this into perspective. Uh, the, the significance of this is that during the managed extraction period, as mentioned earlier, extractions have been just under 120,000. In the last five years, they've been at that number, 127,000. Uh, over the long-term history of the agency, the periods of managed and not managed, it's been about 131,000. And of course, 2007's information is there to place it in context. And of course, we do have the two annual periods semi-annual periods which reflect seasonality. Um, as you can see, uh, pump charge uh, uh, was, it was virtually right on the target that we provided to you in the budget, uh, just a little bit over 555,000. Um, the double up point about the Thornhill Miller, essentially we established the, set, the annual payment uh, requirement for June of, of, uh, of the year, and in this first year there was actually two double payments, or not double, but double up payments of two years. So that's why the surcharge is inflated. Uh, 160 of that 174 is re reflective of those two annual years. Uh, essentially, this is what we earned. Uh, average balance on the quarter, just a little over 700,000 and just under 5% on the county pool. Uh, this puts the status of the revenue performance in the year just closed against our targets and our three-year average, just primarily for comparative purposes. Uh, top five operating expenses uh, begins with PWAC, which is essentially the labor cost. 
um, and then down through there, and all are less than target with the exception of the uh, uh, integrated regional water management contribution that your board authorized. Uh, this provides a chart of the PWAC history, uh, just a couple of data points that, that uh, will help understand it. Uh, the county views 1,800 productive hours of a given FTE as a single full-time equivalent. Uh, on that average last year, we were just a little over two FTEs. You can see how that number related to the past, uh, and you can see the costs were just a little, just under $110 blended cost per hour. Approximately 30. 2,000 of this are uh, CSD fiscal charges and the rest are labor costs. Um, but that's where we are in terms of PWEC. You, you authorized a single transfer from contingency. Uh, so a considerable amount of contingency went back to year-end fund balance. And you can see how that worked through in terms of the past several years. That helped in, uh, increase the fund balance. Uh, your board is well aware but this just recaps the GEMS fund performance of what was collected um, and the, the recently uh, processed credit refund, which is another item that we'll get to in a, in a few moments. Uh, and most importantly, how does fiscal 0708 impact our five-year outlook that was presented to your board in the budget? And the bottom line is that additional fund balance figure pushes out the point of time in which we may or may not have to revisit cost reductions, new revenues, and or adjustments. Uh, it, when we came to you in the budget, it was earlier in 11-12. It's now somewhere in here because you've got to remember that about 200,000, 220,000, when we get about here, of this number is the GEMS uh, proportion. And that would mean only 100, just a little around 100,000 in operating, and that would be getting lower than what has been the comfort level of the policy. So at least the outlook for the next three to four years is very good without any adjustments, assuming all that's in the budget comes to pass. So our recommendation is that you receive and file the year-end report. Anybody want to receive and file? So moved. Second. Okay, good. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Um, now number seven. Let's go backwards. Good afternoon again. Gerhard Huebner. I'll be presenting this item. This is an informational item. Uh, as you recall, when you adopted, uh, we looked at the work plan back in March of this year and we provided you with a draft fiscal work plan. Uh, that work plan contained two sections, section one, which was the agency core work task, and section two, which had the potential additional work tasks. At your April meeting, uh, we revised this draft work plan with estimates of, of hours and costs and potential funding sources. At your May meeting, um, we provided this list, the priority list of the 10 additional work hours for inclusion in the final work plan, uh, which the board approved as part of its final action back with the final fiscal year budget. I've got to go for it. I support this. Okay. Here I've provided a table uh, looking at how we allocate the core work task ass assignments. If you look at our staffing, um, with uh, Dave and Sheila. They are uh, full-time assigned to the GMA. With the other staff, uh, Jeff, myself, Rick, Gerard, Tammy, and others providing the rest. So we looked at, looking at the Section 2 work tasks and how can we accomplish that. We looked at a variety of options including uh, is the possibility of hiring through the county process a full-time person. Uh, we also looked at partnering with the technical services with United through an MOU. As you know, you adopted that as an earlier item today. Um, we've looked at contract for consultant services, for example, the irrigation efficiency audit, uh, database upgrades, uh, internal realignment of existing uh, WPD staff resources, matching their technical skills, with our work plan tasks and needs and or potential student assistant hire. What we're proposing in this action, and I don't have to go through the first bullet, is enter into that MOU with United. You've done that. Um, thank you. Um, the technical staff position will lead and assist in a number of these tasks. Now, if you look at the attachment, 
uh, you will see the attachment with your board package. They're aligned with that. The, the numbers that you see here, as I've listed, tasks 5, 7, 9, 11, and 12. Uh, for the most part, that technical staff person will be assisting with a lot of the technical evaluation and analysis in the Las Posas Basin. Um, some of our credit issue analysis, that person pr could provide us with assistance. Some of the base, sub basin management issues, plan development, uh, technical evaluation of our groundwater management plan strategies, and technical evaluation and assistance at the SAG tag level. This, of course, would free up existing staff resources for other Section 1 and Section 2 work plan tasks. We also have a vacant uh, management assistant two position. This was previously held by the deputy clerk uh, in the early part of 2008. That person left. We could recruit and hire a person. I would recruit with somebody in mind that had data entry and data processing skills to assist uh, with Sheila. That would free her up for some higher level uh, data queries and reports. Um, this would also free up some of Dave's time to allow more focused work on the meter calibration program. As you know, we've hired a new groundwater manager. Um, essentially, we had a swapping. Mr. Labor left. Um, Dave took uh, Chris's position, and that left us with a vacancy. So we haven't actually added a position, but we replaced the position. So realigning some of uh, the duties that our groundwater manager does more so with Fox Canyon work plan tasks versus WPD or County Unincorporated Groundwater Program tasks. Uh, I mentioned Explore utilizing contract services for database improvements uh, that will allow us to be more efficient and uh, some discussion of uh, study audit of our uh, irrigation efficiency program. So if you see some of these numbers, if you look at the 150,000 that your board approved, uh, you subtract 60000 which is approximately 50% of what the technical staff position will cost us with United, at least 90000 And um, if you look at the previous slide, there's 15000 there, uh, 40000 and 35000 and that gives you the bulk of your 150, approximately. So in conclusion, uh, this is a proposed allocation plan, informational item, uh, allow agency staff, we believe, to make substantial progress on many of our fiscal year 2008-2009 work plan tasks. Uh, the attachment, as I mentioned, uh, has been revised to include an additional column where you can see where the lead staff person would be assigned. Uh, in all cases, senior level agency staff would be reviewing that work or overseeing that work um, to completion and as circumstances arise of course uh, or as work plan tasks are completed uh, we, we might do some staff realignment or staff reassignment as the case may be. That concludes my presentation. Okay. Um, uh, um, yes ma'am I'll start there. Um, I was on the board for a few years and I was off the board for a few years and I've been back on for a few years and I completely lose track of time but I know that a couple years ago we uh, voted to hire the uh, uh, county or to retain the county as our, our staff and I just have to say that after listening to the budget presentations and reading the budget uh, presentation and the uh, whatever they are versus actuals uh, and having the work plan developed as we've been we've developed it this, this year and uh, this presentation on staffing uh, I think that this agency is now operating like a, a special special district I think it's operating with structure and accountability and I'm, I'm really proud to be associated with it and, and I, I think that uh, we've gone a long way in the last few years and the difference in what we once were and what we are now is just like night and day. So that's okay. my comment. Very good. Um, I'll jump to the other side. Dave, I saw a big question mark on your nose, so I'm going to let you. Uh, I don't have anything to say. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Not fair. But this is your issue. You and Mike, this is your issue. Man, oh man, oh man. Uh, okay, let me stop there. I'm moving along. Jeez. <laughs> I was hoping to get out of here at. 
two o'clock, but we obviously didn't make that. So um, you got a closed session. Yeah, I got a closed session too. Um, what specifically do you want us to do, if other than just receive it? You don't want. Any, I can't give you any direction. You, you could. Certainly. Okay. All right. Just you're keep doing what you're doing. I second uh, what Charlotte says because if you look at the evolution of the agency over my oops tenure on the oops tenure on the agency, we have grown a lot, and the county has done a great job, and and uh, so we're moving forward, and we've got these tasks to do. Mike, I see you want to speak. No, I was just going to move to accept item seven and eight. Okay, so there we go. There is done. Um, receive and file. There you go. Appreciate the comment. Um, Made a motion. Or I can second his. It's motion. just an informational item, so we don't have to do anything. But there's nothing we have to do on it. Uh, number nine. Do we? Oh, let's just. There's a quick update very, on how are we doing on the numbers. Very quick. Uh, we're here to report today uh, uh, that we did what you asked us. We did it in time. We did it with the cooperation and assistance of Carol Schoen, and uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, no one is upset okay. with us. So, can can we can you do this uh, on behalf of the board? Can can you draft a letter thanking her and her agency for doing this for us and working with us? Be happy to. Because this was an issue that, as you well know, went up and down the flagpole, and your willingness to step forward and solve it and get it taken care of with staff, I appreciate. So we'll acknowledge the fine work that you folks have done. Okay? Let's do that. All right, bring that back at the next board. Thank you, Carol. I just you. ask you to receive and file this. Okay. All right, done. Um, the, the last item, uh, it's just uh, real quick. Yeah, it'll be quick. This is one of those wait good till. meeting. Good, <laughs> this is a bad news, good news item. Um, I had the opportunity to attend the Groundwater Resources Fourth Symposium, uh, Climate Change uh, Implications for California Groundwater Management. And I'll be very quick. Now, very actually, quick. the combination of these slides are from uh, the Southern California Water Resource Project. That's a commission that both Jeff and I participate on. Um, so some of those slides are a mix of that and this presentation. And I'll actually provide a little bit of insight to uh, where I was, I was in Oakland last night talking about stormwater, so give some information. Whether you want to believe it or not, uh, climate change is real. I won't get into the entire statement here, but this is a quote right out of the National Academy of okay. Sciences. Uh, these are two facts. Average global temperature is rising, and so are CO2 levels, uh, along with other greenhouse gases, and the two are related. Whether they're man-made, whether they're natural, we don't need to get in that debate. But these two things, the scientific community is uh, clear on. Last 150 years, global temperatures are increasing, as you see with the graph on your left. Uh, the last 1,000 years, same. You can see the uh, great increase over the last 100 years. Okay. Rising CO2 levels, same. Um, measured both in atmospheric gases and measured in ice core measurement. Uh, sea level rise, and this is where you're going to get into the groundwater management portion. Present rate is 1.8 millimeters per year, accelerating one third from thermal expansion, two thirds from melting ice. The thing I heard yesterday is over the last 100 years, sea level has risen approximately six inches. So, where does this lead to? Why does it involve us? Uh, when I was at the conference, ran into uh, UC Santa Barbara researchers. Coincidentally, they're conducting a study. They're looking at sea level rise. They've conducted a uh, already completed work in Monterey Bay on the seaside aquifer. Um, this is just uh, the first bullet is, as you know, as sea level rises, you have that interface with seawater and freshwater that interface. And so their hypothesis is as sea level rise in the order of one meter would substantially deteriorate groundwater quality with sustained extraction. So what are they going to do? They're going to do numeric modeling with fee flow. They're going to simulate sea level rise of half meter and one meter over 100 years. They're going to use our local aquifer, the characteristics in our extraction data. The study begins this month, be completed a year from now, summer of 2009. They are going to come to the future SAG meeting in October to provide a presentation. And the beauty of it, it's fully funded. 
by the Water Institute. So no money. Uh, we'll get the results, but we don't have to pay for any of it. And so that's uh, my update on that. How much do uh, airplane tailpipe emissions contribute to this? <laughs> I don't know, but I could find out. I do have one small comment. That I, I just wanted to comment, uh, commend Cher. That was a, a just a fabulous bit of oratory there. That you know, I think you've exceeded my expectations on your, on your history of why we're here and what we're doing. And I just I want to commend you. That was our going back to school credits. Yes. <laughs> Yes, the board will be adjourning into closed session to discuss one potential case under government code section 54956.9 subdivision C, and uh, I do anticipate an announcement being made following closed session. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you.